after David killed Goliath, Israel was happy to be free from the terror of the Philistines, but not everyone was pleased. King Saul didn't appreciate the fact that the women in Israel sing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Envy and jealousy built up in him as he heard people singing that a shepherd boy had killed ten times more soldiers than he had. In spite of this, David was invited into the king's palace to play the harp for the king. But envy, jealousy and bitterness would build up to a breaking point. King Saul's son Jonathan and David were very close friends and on several occasions Jonathan interceded for David and persuaded his father to make peace with him. However, as the resentment and envy built up and as his father wouldn't humble himself, it came to the point where David had to flee the palace and go on the run. Initially, he went to the town of Nob and there in the tabernacle, he got the sword of Goliath. However, the priest who helped him, Ahimelech, and the whole city would eventually pay the ultimate price as King Saul killed them all in a rage. Leaving Nob, he went to Achish. But when they found out he was the one who had killed Goliath, he had to leave. Fleeing to the cave of Adullam, he found rest there for a while until Saul pursued him. Then he went to Kayla, then he went to Ziph. Pursued in each location by an angry king, he remained on the run with his men. Then he fled to the mountains of En Gedi, where he found rest in a secluded cave. Here, David hid for a while, but somebody told Saul. David was in a cave with his men when King Saul entered the cave. David's men urged him to kill the king, saying that this was the providence of God. David's conscience spoke to him, though, saying, touch not the Lord's anointed. His men still encouraged him, and so David cut off a portion of King Saul's robe. He felt bad about this, though. As King Saul was leaving the cave, David called after him, saying his men had told him to kill him, that he wouldn't, that he cut off a part of his robe, but he felt bad about this and was sorry. Saul's heart was touched, and he realized that he was completely in the power of the man whose life he was trying to take. They made peace here in En Gedi, but based on Saul's past assurances, David had little hope that his change of heart would remain, and so he stayed here in En Gedi, in these mountains, with his faithful men. David was learning through all these experiences, and each one would eventually help him when he rose to take the throne. David made mistakes, but God's hand was over him, preparing him to be king. David would become the most famous king in Israel's history, and it was through his bloodline that Messiah would come. Here in En Gedi, he demonstrated a foresight, respect, and honor not normally shown amongst men of war. It was this respect for the position and person that God had anointed that further set him apart to be a leader and have such great responsibility later on. May we have respect today in our lives for those that God has called to service and not destroy them with our critical actions and words.
Welcome to the Tallahassee First Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're so glad to have you here today and want to invite up our uh, singing uh, team to come up and we're going to have a prayer before they get here to start. So let's bow our heads and then we'll get right into the worship service. Dear Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day and the time we can be here together. We want to pray that you be with the uh, praise team, that you would bless them and help us to join with them in praising you. We pray for all those involved in today's service that you would be with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It is my privilege to be able to sing with my wife, Betty, and Bertha playing the piano for us today. Uh, we're going to be singing from the hymn. Our first song uh, is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Let's prepare our hearts to worship our God. Uh, this is a special day because it's Sabbath, but also because we can come together and worship and praise him and get together with him. So let's think about this day and these hymns that will praise him. Pass me not our gentle savior. Five, six, nine. gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble Come thou fount of every blessing. 
I, have, yeah. I do have one request, if you don't mind. While you're singing this song, if you can just try and memorize it so that during the week to come, you can maybe bring it to mind in moments um, where you're working or you're with your family, just to have it in the back of your mind. And then at the end of the week, come Friday evening, remember that moment and see if it made a difference in your week. That's my request. Come thou fount of every blessing. Um, and we'll sing number uh, one and number three we're we'll gonna repeat twice. I mean, we're gonna repeat it. So it'll be one, three, and three. Come thou fount of every blessing, till my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. song this morning. We're going to go to 86, How Great Thou Art. If, if, if you've noticed, there was a bit of a theme starting out with recognizing our need for him and, and then looking at him and saying, yes, he's amazing. And now we're praising him for that greatness. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll sing verses. Uh, one and four. The first one and the last one. Oh 
soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. Okay, where are our children? It's time for our children's story. So we will collect our offerings. So if you get your buckets here. And by the way, um, last weekend I was in uh, Georgia Cumberland Conference doing a presentation about the Vacation Bible School. So we'll be showing you the um, promotional video soon. Okay, so you can see what to expect on our Vacation Bible School that will be coming up sometime in July. So when you're done collecting the offering, you can sit here on the uh, steps, okay? And we will do our children's story, okay? Right here, honey. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for collecting the offering today. And thank you for being here. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Well, me too. And I have someone that I have with me today. Let me see. Hello, happy Sabbath. Okay, do you remember her? This is May. Yeah, and May and I will tell you a story today. Do you want to listen to the story today? Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, our story is actually found in Samuel, 1 Samuel, the book of Samuel, chapter 3, and this is about a little boy named Co what? Name Samuel. Yes, Samuel. And guess what? Samuel started as a little boy in the temple. Do you know what the temple is? Yes. A temple is another name for a church. 
Yes, that's correct. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So temple is like our church. But this one, Samuel, had to be there because the mother promised, okay? And so when he was just three years old, he was brought to the temple to serve. Would you like to serve in the church? Yeah? Yeah? Yes, me too. I like to serve in the church. Yeah, May also loves to serve in the church. And so Samuel was brought to the temple, and he started to learn how to work in the temple. What are the things that you can do to help in, around the church or around the temple? Do you know, as a little boy? Any idea? Yes? Yes? What, how can you help around the church? Serve? Yes, how can you serve? I think I can sweep the floor. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, for me, she can sweep the floor. What else? Anything else? Yes? Clean the ark? Okay, well, for the ark, there's a special a person that can go inside the ark or like inside the most holy place where the ark is and that's the high priest so uh, there is um, two division so the holy place and the most holy place so for most of them they can go only in the holy place so for Samuel I think he can dust off tables right some furnitures yeah he can do that and so for um, Samuel he likes doing that because he is now trained to serve in the temple. And so, one night, when all the candles are starting to go off, it's time to go to bed. And just before the last um, candle went dead, because it was nighttime, Samuel started laying down. And then, he heard a voice. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel woke up, and Samuel said, oh, I got to go. So he ran to Eli's bed, and he said, yes, Eli, I'm here because you called me. And Eli said, Eli is the priest, and Eli said, oh, Samuel, I didn't call you. You need to go back to bed. And Samuel said, okay. And so he went back to bed. And just before he closed his eyes again, yes? The voice came back. Yes, the voice came back the second time. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, oh, Eli is calling me again. And so Samuel ran to Eli and said, yes, Eli, I'm here. You, cause I heard you called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. You go back to sleep. And Samuel said, okay, I'm going back to sleep. And so he went back to his own bed. And when he's about to doze off again, because it's, it's pretty late for him, he heard another voice. Samuel, Samuel. And Eli, uh, Samuel said, I got to go to Eli. But then this time, Eli said, ah, I know who's calling Samuel. And so Eli said, Samuel, the next time you heard a voice, you have to sp say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Okay? And so, sorry, it should be the third time. Okay? This, this is just the second time. And so... <laughs> So Samuel went back to his bed, and on the third time, yes, Samuel is not sleeping anymore. He's waiting if somebody's going to call him again, so he's waiting. But he's laying down, and then Samuel, Samuel, and then Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Do you know that right now the world is noisy with so many things, with television, with the music, loud cars, really loud cars, and then 
of course, you've got your gadgets, you watch your uh, stuff in your cell phone or tablets. Just so noisy. Sometimes, God wants to talk to us. God is calling us. And sometimes we don't hear him calling because we are so busy of so many things, busy with school, busy with homeworks, busy with our toys, that when Jesus is calling us, we don't hear. But today, I want you, and you, I want you to do this, practice this at home when you go home. Try to just be quiet and try to listen to that still, small voice that maybe God is trying to talk to you. And do you know that when you pray, you are talking to Jesus? And when you read your Bible, he is talking to you? So who wants to talk to Jesus today and to listen to his voice? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Yes. I hope that you can listen to him. So I want you to say this with me in Psalms. First Samuel 3, the verse 10, okay? That's where you can find this. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Okay, one more. For, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. First Samuel 3, verse 10. Okay, so who wants to pray for us? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you've given us. Please help us to have a great day. Please help everyone to stay safe and have a great day. Please help the rain to go away so we can have fun. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may go back to your seat or go to your Sabbath school, okay? Thank you, Melba. That was a really nice story. We always appreciate your stories very much. Okay, so now we're going to have some announcements today, and I want to invite uh, Debbie to come up here. We're going to talk about the health Sabbath that's coming up next week. And uh, just with a reminder, while she's coming up, next week, in addition to the health uh, event, there's going to be a potluck. So we want to encourage you guys to bring food for that and also to come hungry. And now Debbie's going to share with you about the event. Good morning, church. Um, next Sabbath, Health and Temperance Ministry is having an optimal health um, weekend. It's a weekend event. It's going to be starting on February the 23rd, going through the 25th, with it, which is this Sunday. Um, we're going to have Dr. Marvin Randall, who's from Uchi Pine um, Uchi Pines Health Institute, and I wanted to lead, uh, read a little bit about Uchi Pine because some of us don't know what Uchi Pine is. We may have some viewers on um, our video that don't know what Uchi Pine is. So Uchi Pine is out of Alabama, and they've been there for over 50 years, and they're experiencing applying lifestyle interventions and natural remedies in the prevention and often reversal of disease to help you live a happier, healthier life and equip you to pass that information on. So not only it is our mission with Health and Temperance Ministry to bring these, um, this speaker to you to help you all live a healthier life, but so that you can gather information and take it back to your neighbors, your friends, your family members that may be dealing with some healthy things, health issues, that they can um, live a healthier life and deal with. He will start on the Friday at 7 p.m. on the 23rd. He'll also be going through Sabbath on the 24th with the Mind-Body Connection. And on Sunday at 1 o'clock, he's going to have a demonstration with healing in your home. Um, there will be some time for Q&A on Sabbath evening. Well, Saturday night, and there will also be some time on the Sunday that he may do some short one-on-one -on -one sessions. So if you have anybody that 
is struggling with some health issues or could just use the information on how to better their health, please bring them out and bring yourself out to, to make that event a great event for us. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So we wanna have a first reading for the nominating committee today. The nominating committee is gonna consist of uh, Patrick Slevin, Nadia, Fidel, Ivan Chakoti, Gary Middleton, Elena Bradbury, Joe Cipriani, and Maya Paris. Okay. Uh, we also want to thank everyone, who, uh, the Pathfinders want to thank everyone who came out for the hike last Sabbath. And I don't know if the AV team has a photo. We have a group photo for that. Uh, it, was a, it was a really nice hike. We went to Garden of Eden and got to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up in the ravines uh, around that area. And then there's what Florida rarely has, a view at the end. So it's kind of a unique situation. For those of you who were there, we're, the Pathfinders are very glad you all came out and had a great time learning about God's nature. We also want to thank Elena for the Garden Vesper and announced that March, uh, they were going to have another Vesper, and this one's going to be led up by Pastor Joey, and it's going to be at Josh and Yexi's house. So it's going to be a bonfire, and we're excited about that, a social um, so please plan on March coming to Vespers and enjoying that fellowship with everyone. Lastly, our church is growing. We're very excited that uh, Kai and Leanne are having a baby and a baby girl, and uh, there's a baby shower, um, and we want to encourage you to bring uh, diapers for that on March 9th, March 9th, so start getting those diapers, and bring those at that fellowship lunch. So size one to three is what they want to bring, size one to three. Okay. Um, with that, we also want to, tra we want to transition into our uh, worship service. So let's, uh, I'm going to ask the deacons to come up, and we're going to have the offering for today's service. So for today's offering, I want to read a verse of scripture from Psalm, which is what we've been studying in our quarterly, and verses 15 to 19. Okay, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. So God doesn't just want us to give sacrificially. He wants us to do it in a certain way, with a contrite heart. He wants us to do it out of love. And so then verse 18, it says, Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. They shall offer bulls on your altar. And for those of you who don't know, a bull was kind of like a, a year salary. So you say, I'm going to bring this bull. Uh, God is saying he is going to be pleased with a sacrifice up to that amount, but it has to come from the right place. And God wants it to come out of our heart as giving, not for something to get praised for us, but to praise God and to be thankful for what he's done for us. So as we give, let's try to think about that, to give sacrificially with a heart that's seeking to please God. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this Sabbath, for this opportunity to give. We pray that you'd please bless this gift, help it to multiply, help it to be a blessing to those who need it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, so now we're going to have our prayer, and we want to encourage you guys, if you have a prayer request, there's a white card in front of you. Um, you can make uh, mention of what it is you need prayer for, and then put it in the white boxes on either side, and we'll, we'll pray for it. Um, we also want to pray, especially for our school right now, uh, that God would bless that and continue to guide and direct in that situation. We um, want to encourage you guys, if you're able, to kneel. If not, just join us in prayer as we begin our prayer time. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day, and we pray, Lord, that you would please take care to remember us, Lord, in our um, church today. We pray that you would bless this time that we have as we're learning about your, you and your word. We pray for uh, your, the speaker today, uh, Kenny, that you'd please bless him, Lord, help him to give us a blessing. We pray that we can grow closer to you. We pray, Father, for our school as we are in a, a need of your guidance in that situation, we pray that you bless it, help it to um, be a blessing to the kids. We pray that we can support it in financially and uh, time and effort and assistance in any way. We pray that you would please be with our pastor, Lord, wherever he may be, that you would bless him. We pray that you'd be with all the different leaders here, that you would give them your spirit, we pray, Father, for uh, this country and the, and the world events that are very, a uh, lot of different uh, tumult going on, different hard times, people suffering and dying. We pray for them. We pray that we can see you come soon. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <laughs> um, happy Sabbath, church. Thank you. That's a nice echo. Uh, pray with me just one more time because I am very nervous. Um, so, yeah. Dear Father God, I ask that you will empty me, that you'll use me, Lord, as your vessel. Um, this is not for glory. This is not for anything uh, that I can do, but it's, um, it's, what, it's what you can do through me. So. I pray that your spirit will be with us, rest upon each and every one of us here at this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, I'm hearing weird feedback, but hopefully it doesn't go through. Anyways, um, once again, happy Sabbath. Uh, Gary kept asking me to preach, and I couldn't keep dodging it, so I am now here. Um, caveat, I am not a preacher. I don't claim to be. Uh, I don't even really claim to be a good uh, speaker or anything like that, so um, it's interesting that I keep kind of finding myself up here, uh, but, you know, if the Lord's going to be blessed, then I'm happy. Uh, so I am going to tell you guys um, a little bit of my story uh, in life from me as a wee child kind of to being here uh, and hopefully tie in uh, scriptures with that that it hopefully makes sense. I have had some people uh, say that they're uh, expecting high things from me, and 
do not expect that. Uh, just, you know, just expect the bare minimum, and I think we'll be fine. Um, so uh, we're going to start, of course, with all these things. You know, we went again to Scripture. Uh, and I don't have any slides or anything, so if you have your Bible with you, your phone, you can uh, pull that out. Um, or you can just hear me say the word, you know, uh, you'll get it. But you will get more definitely if you have your, your Bible with you and you um, read along. But the first uh, verse here is Deuteronomy 6, 5, 7. Uh, and it says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, this is God talking to the children of Israel. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. This was done in my home. My parents, uh, to their credit, uh, for me, I can't speak for my siblings, but to, to my parents' credit, they raised us to... They raised us in our home where we were having worship on a, probably a daily basis, but I'm not, I don't even know if it was daily, but it was, it was more uh, times than I actually wanted to be there, but uh, they, they did do that. Uh, and the reason why I say that, I, I kind of preference uh, this verse, let me see this real quick. Yeah, as I kind of talk about the moments that I've went through life, this uh, my, my parents raising me to know God at such a young age was the, um, oh, the, the word left my brain, was pretty much what helped to sustain me and create sort of like my origin story. That's what I was trying to think of, my origin story. Um, yes, okay, and so the reason for that was this. When I was younger, and if you've grown up in the church, or especially like church schools, at some point you've heard some, some speaker person come and tell their story about like how they were like uh, in the streets doing drugs, um, you know, selling dope or something like that. Uh, and as a kid, you hear the story and you're like, oh, that's amazing. That's a cool story. I wish I had something like that. But, you know, I was like, I grew up, my parents, they loved me, thankfully. I didn't grow up in the streets. You know, I wasn't out there trying to sell anything. Uh, I don't have any amazing story where I can say this is where God took me from out of that environment and put me into this, uh, this other environment. But as I've gotten older, I have realized that I do have a story. Um, it may not resonate with every person, uh, but if it resonates with one person, as I was told earlier, right, every sermon has to only resonate with one person here. So there's like, uh, I don't know, 100 or so people here. So if one person gets this, then I did my job. So if the 99 of you guys are complaining, I don't care, because at least that one person got this. All right. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I realized that I didn't need to have this amazing uh, story or this amazing sort of um, experience, like negative experience, to then have God rescue me from that to be able to tell a story. So... Uh, I'm going to talk on three points in my life where I cried out uh, pretty much, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first time this happened was I was six years old. Uh, yeah. So I was six years old. Uh, my mom is having worship with me and my siblings, and she tells us that our dad is not coming home. Uh, he's alive, uh, but he decided that he didn't want to be with our family anymore. At six years old, and I can kind of feel it right now, at six years old, my dad was like, like probably like the thing I looked up to the most. Like my dad was an amazing father. Uh, you know, he was uh, you know, a hard worker. He was very much involved in the church. You know, he was very knowledgeable, but he also was like very loving. I remember one time, this is the weirdest thing, but um, he teased me. This is, it's not going to probably make sense, but... Uh, I was upstairs, he called me down, he pretty much said I was in trouble for something, and so he had a belt with him, he was going to spank me, uh, and so I went to, I guess, receive my spanking, I started crying, of course, uh, and then he kind of like, he stopped and kind of was laughing and was joking, I don't understand it, I'm not saying this is a great story, but the, the essence of it is trying to say that he was humorous, that was the point. But anyway, so my dad was someone who I like, looked up to. I would probably say, especially at that age, she was like an idol to me. Um, and so at six, when my mom says, you know, your dad's not coming home, 
I broke down and I cried and cried and it just, it wasn't great. Um, and so not necessarily at that very moment, but in that same sort of time frame, so maybe within a few days or so like that, I found myself outside in our backyard um, and we had, um, no, I can't think of what you call it now, but uh, the, a trailer, there you go. We had a trailer where you would like carry um, like lawnmowers on, like those big riding lawnmowers on. And I was, remember I was standing on, on, on it, yelling at God, crying my heart out, blaming him for my dad leaving us. And I remember this, and this is like the weirdest thing I, I thought about this this week. I was like, why as a six-year-old would I, would I have this thing hit me? But at six years old, something, I'm going to say obviously the Holy Spirit, of course, but something told me that I would rather have you mad at me than you to ignore me. And so at six years old, I heard the voice of God for probably the first time, and somehow I knew that even though I didn't like this experience, that I was going to be okay. I, I mean, and not necessarily at six was I like, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to be okay. But at six, something told me that, okay, God is there. And I don't really understand what that means because, you know, I'm six years old still. Mostly, like, my, my understanding of God is, like, you know, the Noah stories and God is love and all the, and all the, the sort of the stories you tell, you know, little kids in, like, crater roll. But that beginning uh, uh, was there. And so even though I cried out, my God, have you forsaken me? What I heard back was that I haven't forsaken you, right? I'm there with you. And so at six years old, weird, but that's something that I heard. So I'm going to then jump like 20 years, I think, 20, yeah, no, not jumping 20 years? Sorry, I'm jumping 20 years, okay. So, uh, but just in, in the meantime, you know, I, as I kept getting older, I spent time in the Word, I kept wanting to know who God was, you know, at first it was in part because I wanted to not make my mom upset, you know, because she was a single mother, um, she was putting three, four kids through private school and college, uh, and she was, work, she was working her butt off, so as I got older, I didn't really want to make any trouble for her. So, uh, so that was a part of what kind of helped keep me in, in line, but as I got older, I also realized that I wanted to know God for myself, and so that's what kept me kind of going into Scripture, trying to understand it, trying to understand who he was. Um, but once again, jumping further, when I was around the age of 25, uh, so I pretty much sort of typical a uh, young person. I went to school like most of us do. Uh, and when I was in college, I was getting ready to graduate. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Actually, I, I didn't in any way know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but I had some people say, hey, maybe you could be like a pharmacist. And I was like, oh, what is that? And they're like, I don't know. So I shadowed a, a pharmacist for like one day. Didn't really enjoy it, but I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life anyways, so why not apply? So I applied to pharmacy school. Uh, for some reason, they let me in. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, and so I went to pharmacy school. So four years uh, doing that, I graduated with my doctorate in pharmacy, uh, and then I got done. Uh, I got a job in Nebraska, and so I was there to be with my wife uh, and started working. But while I was there, I was still... Like I was working in the pharmacy, I was working as like a, a pharmacist, really like a pharmacist intern, uh, but I still had to take my, my licensure or to, to be able to practice like on my own um, and like make the big pharmacist bucks. Um, and so, you know, as I did, I started taking my tests, you know. Uh, I took the first two tests, so you have to take a state test and a national test. I took them both, I passed my state test, I failed my licensure, my national exam. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's tough. I don't know why that happened, because, you know, I'm pretty good at taking tests for the most part. Um, so maybe it was, it was some fluke. I didn't study hard enough. So, okay. So go back. I have three months to, to, to prep. Study, 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 study. Go there, take the test. I fail it again. I'm like, oh, two times. What is going on? All right. Okay. Don't get it. Uh, but I'm sure... There's a reason why uh, I didn't do it. I just didn't study hard enough. You know, I just, I didn't pay enough attention in school, apparently. Uh, so let me just get back in there. I'm going to grind, grind, grind. While I'm doing this, while I'm, I'm staying for this test, you know, I'm still working in the pharmacy. Uh, I'm still pretty much working as a pharmacist intern. 
I'm, you know, still with everyone that I'm, I'm working with, and a few things are hitting me. So, like, I think one of the first days that I started working, one of the other pharmacists uh, made a statement. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly exact wording, but she would pretty much ask me, you know, like, how do I feel about working here? And I was like, oh, I'm excited, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And she's like, oh, you're still new. Just wait till you're here for a little while. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, people don't really like it here. Uh, and so I started to realize, like, the other pharmacists that I worked with didn't really enjoy their jobs. In fact, the ones who did were the ones who worked, like, one day a week for, like, four hours. And that was it. Anyone who had to stay there for longer wasn't a fan of it. Anyways, I'm like, okay, well, whatever. That's, it is what it is. That's not me. So I keep studying, you know, get ready to take uh, the test the third time, ensure that I'm going to pass it because the first time I didn't do so great. Second time I did uh, better, about a few points away from passing it. So I was like, this third time, it's on me. I got this. I'm going to ace it. I go there, and somehow, no, maybe I missed that up point wise, but somehow I go there and I failed it again. And I'm like, yes, oh my goodness. That's what my mom said. My mom was like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you pass this test? I'm like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I pretty much went to school all my life. You know, I t took tests all the time. I should be able to pass this thing. It shouldn't be that hard. So I, I'm trying to remember all this stuff because at some point I start to forget stuff. Um, anyways, while I passed, I failed the third time. I am now still working, you know, still kind of discouraged, but, you know, I got to get up there, still got to work, still got to, you know, uh, make money. You know, I got a, a wife to help take care of. I mean, she still works, so they don't have to do it all. But, you know, uh, I still have the responsibilities that come with just uh, being an adult. And so while I am studying getting, or getting ready to, to take this test again, I realize something. I realized this. I said, if I didn't make pharmacist money, I would never be here. I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't really like coming to work. I didn't like having to work every day. And I still had a smile. I still tried to be a positive person. But for the most part, there was nothing about that that I enjoyed. In fact, um, so if you've, assuming many of you guys have been in a retail pharmacy at some point in your life, um, in the retail setting, right, the whole point is kind of the patient comes, picks up their medication, uh, you help them with whatever you can, and then they leave. Uh, when I was working, and it, again, it's, this can vary from, from place to place, so I'm not trying to uh, call out, you know, that particular field, but whenever a patient would come in, I would immediately be annoyed, so I was like, why are you here? I didn't say this to them, of course, but I was like, why are you here? I need to do the work of filling these, these um, not pill, pretty much filling the prescriptions in order for them to then go out. But every time the person's come in wanting the prescription, I'm like, oh, you're like bothering me at my job, which is literally to serve you. So I realized I'm not really enjoying this, but what else am I going to do with my life? I did not have any sort of plan other than I'm going to just keep going until I'm at a point, and therefore I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. So for me, when I was, you know, when I was in college, I didn't really know what I was going to but I was like, well, someone said pharmacy. And now I'm, I'm in pharmacy school. I'm passing, I'm passing, I'm passing. I'm about to be done. I'm done. Yeah, I graduate. Now I'm into the real world. I'm working in a pharmacy. I pass, and then I just start working. You know, And then I, I don't know, be miserable for the next 40 years, and then I retire. So anyways, I know, right? Yeah, you found it funny. Uh, so, <laughs> so the test comes for the fourth time. And I'm, I'm ready for this one. You know, I'm like, OK, I got this. I'm going to do this one. I'm going to pass it. I studied my butt off. Uh, I've had Catherine kind of help me. I've done, you know, I tried to do like the test to prep myself for it. And I go there and say, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't say anything. I go there, I take the test. I'm like, I did it. I passed it. I passed it. I get the results. I failed it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think, and at one point, Catherine was like, how many times can you take it? And I was like, I don't know, a lot? Uh, you can't take it a lot. You can take it, I think, five times, and then you got to do a whole thing. So I'm on, on test number four. And so I, I asked myself this question. Why am I doing this? What is the point for me, personally? Right? You know, this, is, this is my story, right? So why, why am I 
doing this thing? Why do I want to be this pharmacist? You know, and, and the blessing of having a, an amazing wife is something I cannot truly uh, describe. But whenever you go through hardship, when you have them near, you know, by your side, it is a blessing. So all of you people who have those, count yourself blessed. So I talked to her, um, and part of her job is actually working with college students to help them figure out what they want to do in life. Uh, and I don't think I ever really got to talk to her about this. Uh, but anyways, at some point, we're in the car and we're talking. And she's like, well, what do you want to do in life? And I'm like, I don't know, like, um, help people kind of. And, I was, and, you know, and I'm like, eh. And I was like, well, I really, for myself, and hold on, I got, yeah, I got time. All right, I really, for myself, that what I actually liked, policy, which is weird, that no one ever really, I never saw that as a path for my life. I never really had anyone say, hey, policy's a thing people do. You know, I, you don't know it. Uh, but as I was in pharmacy school, one of the things I kind of realized that, that, I don't, you don't realize it, I guess, until you work in it, is that the healthcare system in this country, and I'm not trying to, you know, bes besmirch all of it, but the healthcare system in this country is fundamentally flawed because that's how it's designed. It's designed to be a flawed system. Most people don't realize this until they're trying to navigate in it, or if you work in it and you realize, oh, why do we do things this way? Or why do we do it that way? You realize it's, it's just created to be that way. And if you want to make change, Really, the only thing, the, the way to make change is to change the laws that determine how it operates. So, anyways, in the pharmacy, I would see people come through, and I would like see a person who's like on a blood pressure medication, and then I would see, you know, in their car they had like McDonald's. Not throwing shade at McDonald's, but you know, it is what it is. Anyways, so you would see that they're doing the thing that's going to trigger the need for this medication and they're going to continue to need the medication because they don't change the initial thing, right? It's, it's not a feedback loop, but it kind of ends up being cyclical of a sense, right? You get health, or you, you, know, you lose, your blood pressure becomes controlled because of the fact that you're using um, medication, and so therefore you can eat more unhealthy, and that makes it go up again, so you got to take more medication. It, that's what I mean by cycle, and this is not the whole point of the story. I'm getting to it, I know. Uh, but anyways, uh, <laughs> fourth test failed. Uh, I had to ask the question, why am I doing this thing? And while I'm kind of going through this whole despair, I'm actually like, uh, you know, I, I, I have the opportunity to take some days off or whatever, and I'm walking around my town, or not my town, but like my neighborhood, and I'm talking to God, and I'm saying, why are you doing this to me? I did everything right. I went to school, I studied hard, I got decent grades, sometimes really good, sometimes not so good, uh, but I passed, right? I took the time to study hard, to, to I don't know, be diligent, uh, so that way I could become a pharmacist. And now I'm here, and I keep failing. And I've never failed before to this extent. Like I've, I, I, I will admit, in my life, I have probably failed uh, twice prior to this time, like classically is what I mean, classically. Um, and usually is when I didn't really care, but the moment I put in effort, I would do quite well, right? So now I'm like, I'm putting in effort, and I am not doing well. Like, I don't know why this is happening to me, but it is. And so I remember thinking to myself, um, would I kill myself if I couldn't pass? That was a thought. And then I immediately was like, no, nah, it's not that big. Not worth it for me personally. But I, I realized that that level of sort of feeling of despair, because where I thought I was supposed to be, like the culmination of everything, was no longer where I thought I was supposed to be at. And, and I realistically could have said, even to this day, of course, I could, I could say, well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to work my butt off in order to, pass, to be this thing. But what was the point? Right? So anyway, so I felt God had once again uh, forsaken me. Right? And in that, he was like, no. I'm going to give you something that you don't really know you want, but we're going to go on a journey together. And granted, at the time, I didn't really realize that was what was happening, but he was doing that. So I quit the pharmacy. Uh, I found a, a little small uh, job uh, working at a chiropractor for a while. Because I wanted to be, because this is something I realized. Like, I realized, okay. I want to be in public policy. Uh, I have the pharmacy understanding of things. So I know how that works. I don't really know how the rest of healthcare works. 
Um, and I started looking at government positions. Um, and as I was doing that, I remember I had applied for one, and they rejected me. And I contacted them and said, hey, why are you rejecting me? Like, I have like a great resume. And they're like, well, yeah, you have great like health care, but you don't have any sort of like administrative experience. And I was like, that's a thing? So Anyway, so I was like, let me see if I can go find some administrative experience so that way I can kind of get into this. So I, I did that. Um, and eventually, that did lead me to a state job, which was great because I kind of started seeing what it was like to work in that world. Uh, and then God took me out of that and then put me into uh, teaching, which was kind of weird. But in that time, he did a couple things with me that I thought was great. One, I got more involved in church. Um, and this is a random caveat, but I'll say this. At some point, I realized that if I became a pharmacist, I was going to be lost. And the reason for that was that I, in my life now, realize my need for God. At that time, my need for God was solely connected to sort of my external things. So finances or school grades, things that were just sort of like the, the tangible things we always think about, not so much the spiritual aspects. So at that time, I was like, well, I'm going to be making six figures. I don't really have any issues or concerns. So why do I need God at this point? Crazy thought to have, but that's where apparently I was at. Um, so anyway, so while I'm in this journey, he allows me to like, get more involved in our church, um, and then I end up getting involved in prison ministry, which was one of the most sort of like, uh, uplifting things for me, getting to work with gentlemen who are actually like, in the prison system, uh, especially for, you know, if you've grown up your entire life in Adventism, you oftentimes don't get to see what's out there. You don't get to see what other people experience. And so for me, being able to do something like prison ministry was uh, like amazing because I, I'm seeing gentlemen who are also coming to Christ, but from a whole other like angle, like from a whole other world that I never got to, to experience, uh, from, like murdering, killing, drug selling, all that good stuff. Not good stuff, of course, sorry. Uh, but all those things that uh, weren't something that I experienced. And so the Lord was still doing something with me and was giving me a purpose that I didn't have up until that point. Anyways, I'm going to jump forward a couple more years uh, as well. So we ended up in Tennessee because I decided I was going to go back and get my uh, Master's of Public Health degree. Uh, and I'm getting done with that degree, and I'm starting the whole job search thing. And I've said some of my story here. I'm not going to say it either. But as I'm starting the job search thing, and at this point, I have my doctorate in pharmacy, and I have a master's in public health. I've worked in healthcare, government, education, right? So I have a weird but a pretty decent-looking resume. So anyway, so I'm applying for these jobs, and I am, like, not getting anything. Like, I'm not getting any callbacks. Uh, I'm not hearing anything. You know, eventually I'll just be like a thing that says, oh, this job has been uh, closed or it's been filled or something like that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, my teachers were all like, oh, man, no, you're like, your resume is great. You're going to find something really quick. It's like, no issue. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's just not happening for me. And I am concerned, right? We have very little bit of finances left. Um, at this point, it was just my little graduate teaching position that was... Um, uh, that was kind of sustaining us uh, and the help of family members as well. I was, in my mind, I was thinking a couple of things. I was like, okay, one God, this is back to this thing, I feel like you're forsaking me again, right? You brought me to Tennessee. You opened up all these doors, right? We got here, um, and now we're at the end of this, and I'm supposed to be work. I'm supposed to you know, be getting a job really easily, and nothing is working. I'm like, oh, you're forsaking me again. What is happening? Now, mind you, when I say this, he hasn't forsaken me at any other point. But, of course, my human fleshly dumb brain, I'll just say dumb brain, my dumb brain keeps thinking, oh, yeah, I'm in a, in a, in a bad state, so therefore he's forsaken me now. So uh, I keep applying, not getting anything. Uh, and then, let's see, I graduated in May. I think I got my last paycheck, I think, like, like May or maybe June. And mind you, at this point, this is where you, it's, it's funny how God does things, but because we're so stuck on 
what we want or what we desire. We don't see what he's doing. So before I graduated, uh, two things happened. One, my, uh, the, the program that I was part of, they had asked me if I could do some adjunct teaching for them the following semester, or so the next year. Uh, and then one of my professors came to me and said, hey, could you help me out do some research? Uh, both of those things are going to pay me money. Both of those things are going to be remote, so I don't have to worry about being specifically in uh, Knoxville area. So I have jobs coming in, right? But they're not the job that I was expecting, uh, and they're not going to give me, I guess, the money or whatever that I thought I, was, I, I should get. So, you know, I'm still over here stressing, saying, God, you have forsaken me. And he's like, <laughs> I haven't forsaken you. You just are so close-minded that you won't see what I'm actually trying to do for you. So uh, I, you know, I say, keep applying, keep applying, keep applying. I think things are just like the worst thing ever. Um, you know, mind you, when I would talk to people, they're like, oh, so like how are, I guess because I'm, I'm worried about finances. So like, oh, how are your finances? I'm like, okay, they're good enough to get us to like May, maybe June. Uh, and then after that, I just don't know, right? And after that, now we're going to be homeless. Uh, we're going to be living in a Honda CRV, bunch of cats, uh, or I'm going to have to live with my brothers uh, and their wife, uh, wife, my brother and his wife uh, and their kids, or I'm going to have to go back home to my parents, or just all these are the thoughts that are going on in my brain. Uh, and so, let me kind of just skip ahead. I got three job offers in was it June? June 1st. June 1st, I got three job offers. Uh, two were good. One was a good opportunity, but it just wasn't sustainable for us. Uh, and so I obviously accepted the one which brought us here. And then after I thought I, I kind of took, uh, took a stock and looked, uh, I realized I only had, I think, one month, really we'll say two weeks, where I was out of school and I didn't have a job. I was freaking out for months, saying that God's forsaken me, that he's not going to do anything for me, for a two-week period of any real stress, to be honest. But that was kind of the, uh, the reality uh, that I had. Now, I kind of say all this in my, and, and these are sort of my experiences because a couple of things. One, God is constantly taking each and every one of us on a journey. And he doesn't forsake any of us. He doesn't abandon any of us. What tends to happen is that we start to freak out because we think something that we've gone through is just like too great for God. It, it, it could be even the smallest sins, right? I speak to myself when I say these things that we, for whatever reason, we think that God's not big enough to deal with whatever issues we're going on, not remembering that we're, we are kind of like a grain of sand to him. It's not like there's anything that he, one, hasn't seen. It's not like your life is somehow taking him by surprise, and he's like, oh, I didn't know you were going to have a job. No, he knows what's going on. So why do we have this mind that says, ah, it's not going to happen? I got some other Bible verses real quick. Exodus 6, 7 says this. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of, Egypt, uh, out of the burdens of the Egyptians. The story of Israel is something to me that is so fascinating because it doesn't start from a people who are believing, and then God comes and does something. It actually starts from God doing something, him saving them, and then taking them on a journey and saying, get to know me. The reason why I say this is that in each and every one of our lives, God has already done the thing first that gives you the reason to believe. You can choose not to believe if you don't want to, right? But he's already done the thing. In my own life, when I was six years old, he already said, I got you. The rest of my life, I should not, and, and I say this because the reality is you might see me up here again saying, I said, I, he said, I said it again, he forsaken me. No, but he started at the beginning and said, I got you the entire time. He didn't say, hey, I have you for a moment. He said, the entire time I will have you, but it is me who doesn't trust him. 
right? The concept of, of me saying, right, sort of the, the hubris of me, to say that he's forsaken me is because I'm not willing to genuinely trust in him for that. In Jeremiah 29, uh, in this kind of theme, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, it says these things. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into the exile. And the same thing here in Jeremiah, we see that God's already saying, hey, I already have all this stuff taken care, right? There's, there's nothing that you really need to do other than trust me. God is so great that he gives us the reason to believe before we necessarily have to believe. That's something that I've had to understand. That's something I'm still, I'm still, let's say, understanding. Um, and it's something that I probably will continue to understand uh, just here on this earth because of, like I said, that, that, that dumb brain that I have. But it only is possible, and this is kind of, I'm trying to uh, think. Oh, yeah, we're going to be out here super quick, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, application. It is only possible to truly trust in God if you have a relationship with him. It is not, it is not something that sort of just comes out just, you know, passively or just because, but it is based out of that relationship. Um, when Thomas, uh, okay, after Christ died and Thomas uh, is in the room and he's kind of like the only disciple who, did, who didn't see Christ after the resurrection, you know, he finally gets to see Christ, and Christ says, you know, blessed are you um, because you've seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe, right? The essence of being able to believe, even though you haven't seen, is because you all have that connection with God, right? It's, it's, not, it's not as, as I guess we'll say some may, may think it's just like a feeling. No, it is a genuine, you have to spend that time with him. What my parents did for me before I was six, of raising me to have a, an inkling, an understanding of Christ, that was a foundation, right? That's what began my journey that said, hey, I see how my parents are moving, right? And, and, and for me, a, long, a, lot, a, lot, a large portion of my life was seeing how my mom was operating. That definitely did encourage me and allowed me to then want to then understand what her journey is, like how is she able to have this faith um, despite everything that she's going through, Right, but then as I then had my experience with God, even though I wavered, even though I wavered, and this is something uh, my wife said to me ages ago, uh, paraphrasing of course, but she, I remember at one point she she said that she loved the fact that like I had this faith uh, despite the things that were going on, and I remember I said, I don't know any other way to be, I don't know how to exist in this world if God is not there with me. Right? And the only reason I could get to that was because of the fact that I kept seeking after him. It wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not, don't look at this as a thing for, what was it? don't look at what I'm saying as because I have some sort of great relationship with God because I'm such a great guy that it's possible to have this, this belief and this understanding. No, I'm simply saying as you continue to journey with him, as you continue to strive with him, it makes it possible to believe spite the circumstances that you're going through, right? So, the last thing I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave off, but I'm going to try to make this uh, <laughs> come together. The relationship that we have with God is not meant to just be individual. It, 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 we aren't meant to simply, let's say, go to our room, have a relationship with God, and then go out, and that's it, and there's, there's no sort of tangibility to it. Right? As we were talking to, uh, this morning in Sabbath school, the essence of the relationship that we have with God helps to then bring us together. Because the reality is, you know, and God knew it, that beyond, I mean, I don't want to sound blasphemy, so I'm not trying to say it this way, but beyond the aspect of our connection with God, who we do have to very much have that faith and belief in because we don't get to see him as our senses can normally interact, 
we have this body of believers, right? The body of believers is the other thing that helps to sustain us, right? Because there are times, uh, and I didn't say I was within my story, but there are times that throughout my life when I was going through what I was going through, having someone I could talk to kept me going. Having someone who was there to uplift me, to say, hey, I'm praying for you, to say, hey, I will pray with you, to say, hey, let's go, let's just sit, let's talk for hours about nothingness, right, about just a random conversation. It doesn't necessarily have to be on, uh, you know, about how God isn't so great to you. But those things are what help to keep me going, right? That relationship with God and the body of believers is what helped me to keep going. I mean, it's still, to be honest, what helps me to go uh, even to this day. To the point uh, that we're here at this church, uh, you know, I'm going to call out because of Maya, right? Maya did such a great job of introducing herself that I was like, ah, there seems to be something here at this place, right? And it's not just Maya, of course. Many of you guys have been this way. But it was that aspect of seeing there's a spirit here that I want to get to know even more. And it also resonates with the spirit that I know, right? Those are the things that came together. So here, and this is where I'm going to kind of close out, in Hebrews 11.39, it says, and I know this will sound familiar to every uh, portion, partial, parts of it will sound familiar for sure. It said, uh, in Hebrews 11.39, it says these things, and all these having attained a good testimony through faith, so this is like, this is part of the faith chapter about the different people throughout scripture who had like uh, faith and they trusted in God. So it says, uh, all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. So, you know, of course, for, the, for Israel, the promise for them was like going to be um, the Messiah coming, uh, their nation being like on top, uh, literally God coming back, all these things. But they did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The beauty of this day and age that we live in is we get to see everything, well, not everything, but we get to see more or less the story of salvation come to its culmination, right? We have the scriptures which lets us know this is what God's done in the past, this is what God is doing in the present, this is what God's going to do in the future, right? But, uh, once again, trying to bring it back and connect it, we don't fully get that if we don't have that relationship with God. There's the spirit that reveals these things to us. It helps us to understand these things, and it ultimately is the spirit that connects us to another. So, my application, hopefully maybe, is that each and every one of us, right, have to be intentional about knowing God, about being vulnerable with him, allowing him to see you. So as you go through your hardships, even if you say, God, you've forsaken me, you still can have him saying, I'm not forsaking you. You're going through some hardships, yes, right? We're all human. We go through those things. We live in this world but I'm still here for you. And as you do that, as you continue to seek to know him, as you read your scripture, as you pray, as you get to know one another, as you sit and talk or come to Sabbath school, famous plug. <laughs> um, but as you do these things, it'll become easier and easier, this faith experience that we have. It'll be easier to put away the sins that do try to ensnare us. It'll be easier to get to know each other, it'll be easier to grow together, to become a body of Christ. I mean, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. All right. uh, musicians, thank you. Uh, we can all stand and sing <clears throat> hymn number 647, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
Thine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lighting of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sounded for the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. For God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. was born across the sea with that glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us live to make men free while god is marching on glory glory Father, thank you so much for the testimony that we've heard today. I pray that um, we have that same desire to, to um, be honest with you. Um, as he said, uh, God would rather have us, you know, angry and frustrated than completely walking away from him. Help us to open up our hearts in every moment of our life um, to him, to you. So that, so that we can, you know, let that burden um, drop at your feet and stay connected with you. Be with us this day, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.